you know, early on uh, in my faith, I came across the book of Romans, and it quickly became one of my favorite uh, books of the Bible. It was written by the Apostle Paul, and uh, it was written to be a clear, concise uh, story of the gospel. You see, Paul, early in his life, before he was a Christian, had traveled to the city of Rome, but uh, but as far as we know, he had never actually been to the city of Rome as a Christian and had longed to go there to preach the gospel and to encourage the Christians and the believers there. But he wasn't sure he was ever going to make it there. As things were going, uh, he was often being persecuted, thrown in jail and prison. Uh, things weren't going always perfectly for the Apostle Paul. And so he was afraid he wasn't going to ever get there. And so he wrote the book of Romans to give them a very clear story and understanding of the gospel. And he starts the book off by introducing himself. And then he quickly uh, dives into what we refer to as the story of the gospel or the story of God, the story of redemption. He, he starts talking about the fact that we as humans are created by God. And we believe that every human being is created by God intentionally, purposefully, with a plan. Uh, we believe that all human beings are created with the image of God. Uh, there's a great Latin term refer that refers to this as the imago Dei, that we are created by God to look like God, to act like Him, to have a friendship with Him that is so vibrant and so beautiful that we begin to reflect His character uh, to the people all around us. And it's awesome, and Paul talks about this in, in the book of Romans. Uh, the, the tragedy, however, is that we as human beings, uh, we messed it up big time. We sinned. Uh, we chose to rebel against God rather than realizing we, we were created to reflect him, uh, humanity chose to do what it wanted to do, to reflect itself and our own desires, not realizing that our sin would separate us from God. And not only were we separated from, from having friendship with God, but sin has, has radically corrupted the human nature. We all have a heart infection. In fact, the Old Testament refers to our hearts as being infinitely wicked. And the Apostle Paul talks quite a bit about this uh, in the first two chapters of the book of Romans. He talks about human beings being totally depraved, meaning that we are so sinful that we're incapable of doing good things. We are extremely wicked. There is not one human being uh, that is immune to this heart infection, uh, this total depravity. In fact, we are so depraved that we are willing to worship created beings rather than the creator. This is what the Apostle Paul unpacks for us. And he talks about the fact that not even one of us is righteous, not even one. And so now that we know that we have been declared unrighteous because of our sin, now that we know that we have been totally depraved and separated from having a friendship with God. We now are forced to go at life on our own. And uh, if we go into eternity as unrighteous, uh, we face the possibility of being separated from God for all of eternity. But God loved us so much, and he makes a way for us to be declared righteous again. Yes, we know that we are depraved, that we've sinned, uh, but the Apostle Paul tells us in the scripture, in the book of Romans, that there is a righteousness that can come to us. There's actually two ways to be declared righteous. One way is to be perfect, to never make any mistakes, to never sin, never lie, uh, never hurt anyone, to follow God's perfect commandments 100% of the time. That's option one. Uh, the second option is to follow what the scripture talks about is, is saving faith. So we can either be perfect, I'm not, about, I'm not sure about you, but I'm pretty sure I'm not so good at being perfect. Or we can come to Christ and choose to put our faith and hope in him. And then he declares us as righteous. The Bible says this in Romans. Romans chapter 3 says, But now the righteousness of God has been manifested apart from the law. Although the law and the prophets bear witness to it, the righteousness of God through faith in Jesus Christ for all who believe. The Apostle Paul is telling us, yes, we were sinners. Yes, we were totally depraved. Yes, we were uh, separated from God. We were losers. We deserved to burn in hell. However, but, he says, but, oh, I love when there is a but in the word of God. He says, but the righteousness of God has been made known to us through faith. Through faith in Christ, we go from being dirty and guilty to being clean and innocent. 
through faith in Christ, we go from being enemies of God to being children of God. We go from being unrighteous, not having access to God, to being declared righteous and having permanent access to God. The Apostle Paul then begins to elaborate on the idea that righteousness comes by faith by using Abraham as an example. If you're not familiar, Abraham uh, was the patriarch in the Old Testament. He's sort of the father or the godfather of, of the nation of Israel. And uh, God calls him out from where he was living and makes kind of this really cool, special agreement with him where God tells Abraham to do something and Abraham actually believes him. Abraham takes God at his word and Abraham begins to believe and agree with what God is saying. He believed God and it was credited to him as righteousness. Here's what the Apostle Paul says in Romans chapter 4. What then shall we say was gained by Abraham, our forefather, according to the flesh? For if Abraham was justified by works, he has something to boast about. You see, Paul saying, hey, if Abraham had done this of his own accord, he could brag about it. If Abraham could say, listen, I was a good guy, I followed God's law, I was perfect, then he could get up and he could brag about the fact that he was righteous. But he begins to make it clear in Romans chapter 4, verse 3. For what does the scripture say? Abraham believed God and it was counted to him as righteousness. You see, Paul makes it very clear. Abraham believed God and he was declared righteous. That's it. And the same is true for you and I. If we come to God and believe him, we are declared righteous. It doesn't say that Abraham believed God and he also was a good person and he was declared righteous. It doesn't say that. It doesn't say that Abraham believed God and he helped serve in VBS at his church and it was, he was declared as righteous. It doesn't say that. Abraham believed God and he never watched the rated R movie and was declared righteous. Abraham believed God and he broke up with his girlfriend and he was declared righteous. Abraham believed God and never listened to a secular song and was declared righteous. It actually doesn't say that. It's very clear. He believed God and he was declared righteous. You see, so often we have this intrinsic need to earn our keep. We have this desire to prove that we're good enough. And what Paul is making very clear through the first few chapters of the book of Romans is that we aren't good enough and there's nothing that we could ever do to become good enough. You could never be righteous enough to be righteous enough for God. There's only one thing you can do to become righteous. There's only one thing that you could ever do to gain the status that God wants you to have, and that is faith. And quite frankly, there's not much to do. It's, it's a matter of believing Jesus because he's actually already done all the work. He's done the heavy lifting on our behalf. The Romans weren't the only ones that the Apostle Paul uh, made this very clear to. In Philippians, he, he says to the church in Philippi, uh, righteousness is by faith. He says this to the, the church in Ephesus. He says these words, powerful words, for by grace you have been saved through faith. And this is not of your own doing. It is a gift of God, not the result of works, so that no man can boast. He says this later in the book of Romans. The Apostle Paul tells us this. Because if you confess with your mouth that Jesus is Lord and you believe in your heart that God raised him from the dead, you will be saved. For with the heart one believes and is justified, and with the mouth one confesses and is saved. For the scripture says everyone who believes in him will not be put to shame. What a powerful promise. Everyone who believes will never be put to shame. Jesus, in fact, made this same point in John chapter 6. Jesus said, all who believe will have eternal life. Those are the promises of God. Not my opinion, not the opinion of any preacher. That is the opinion of the creator and sustainer of the universe. And why does he do this? Because he loves you. God knows that none of us could ever come to him of our own volition. He knows we couldn't do it. We were too dirty, too unrighteous. We had made too many mistakes. We had blown it so big that we corrupted ourselves to the point of being incapable of coming to God. So God came to us. Jesus walks among us and he, he makes a way 
for us to come back to God, to be reconciled with God through simple faith. I think that begs the question, what is faith? People ask all the time, what does it really mean to have faith? I think the Apostle Paul highlighting Abraham makes it clear. Uh, He says he believed God. He believed what God had to say. A friend of mine recently tweeted a a quote that I thought was interesting, kind of elementary, but I thought it was profound at the same time. He said, faith in its simplest form is merely agreeing with God. Uh, Several years ago, I was traveling to a a speaking engagement. And uh, while I was traveling there, I was approaching a bridge with with some toll booths. And uh, just a few yards away from where the toll booths were, there was a car parked, uh, pulled over on the side of the road. And I remember seeing it pulled over, so I, you know, kind of slowly pulled up alongside the car, and I yelled out, uh, "Say, hey, everything all right? You know, how's it going?" And and the guy says, uh, "Oh, you know, I'm good. I just, uh, I only have credit cards, and the toll booth they only take cash, so I got to figure out what I'm going to do. Maybe I have to turn around and go find an ATM." And so I just yelled back, "Hey, don't worry about that. Just follow me. I'll I'll take care of it." The guy was was really confused and kind of surprised. I said, "Yeah, come on, just." Just follow me. So I slowly start taking off and and expected him to to follow me. At that moment, that man had a choice to make, uh, to either choose to believe me or choose to reject what I said. He could either agree that I was saying the truth and believe what I declared and the promise I made him, or he could reject what I was saying and try to go go at uh, the toll booth on his own. And the same is for us today. Uh, God looks at us and says, believe what I'm telling you. I'm making you an offer. Are you willing to believe it? The guy had to make a choice to be a believer before he actually begins to follow. You see, when I yell out and say, hey, follow me, I will pay the toll for you. He has to make a choice to determine whether or not he's actually going to believe me or if he's going to reject me and believe that I'm not telling the truth. And the moment he chooses to believe me is the moment he has become a believer. Naturally, we would then expect that a believer will follow the person that has made the offer. And Jesus says the same to us today. He is making an offer to us, saying, believe what I'm offering you. Believe what I say in such a way, so firmly, so sincerely, that it causes you to follow me with your life. Our righteousness is predicated on our faith, not our behavior. Why does why does this really matter? If we seem to somehow believe that our actions or our works uh, influence God's opinion of us, or if we believe that our behavior makes us more righteous or less righteous, we begin to then be in work mode. We begin to do for God and work hard to please God rather than enjoying God. We begin to have this to-do list of all these things we have to do rather than simply choosing to engage with him and experience the love that he wants us to experience. If you are too busy doing things for God and seeking to obey him, you will never ever experience the love and freedom that he desperately wants you to experience. He has given you all of his love as soon as you believe. God has given you all of his approval and all of his affection. God approves of you. His opinion of you is through the roof. Why? Because you believed him. Let me leave you with this last scripture verse. The Apostle Paul says this in Romans chapter 5 verse 8. But God shows his love for us that while we were still sinners, Christ died for us. So if God was thinking about you and loving you so much to die for you when you were hating him and never even thinking about him, how much more is now God going to pour out his love now that you're actually one of his? God desperately and passionately loves you and has rescued you and your actions and your behaviors have nothing to do with it. Your sin doesn't cause God to think less of you and your righteous behavior and your good works Don't cause to think highly of you. God thinks great things about you because he loves you and because you believe.